Hi guys, today we are at Airbus in Toulouse. We are here for the Airbus Summit. Obviously, you're here in the commercial aircraft industry. Look at these dimensions. You heard the CEO of Airbus himself talking about the decarbonization of the aviation industry. So, as a sailplane pilot, for me it's really important to fly without emissions. And he has some really interesting input on hydrogen fuel, electric airplanes and more. And you can check out his video. I'm going to put the link in the description. Guess what? This is the battery of an actual airplane that has flown only for a couple of minutes. Electric aviation isn't so far yet, but this baby weighs 300 kilograms. Hi Lea. Hi. Nice meeting you. We have batteries here. So what's the difference between this battery and your battery? Well, basically, thanks for the question. This is a battery that we could say this is a state of the art. Yes. This, is, this is lithium ion cells technology. Yeah. Okay, and this is a typical arrangement where we have them uh, in several modules. Yes. The point of aviation is that to make them uh, fly safely, we always need to associate it to this type of enclosure that are heavy and bulky and that are reducing the overall performances and they are not so interesting uh, from a technology and performance perspective. And yours? This one is our next generation of batteries. This is called solid state technology. You can see here that the cells are different and there are two significant advantages on this technology. First one is that uh, the performance of each of the cells is higher. We are getting more energy per cell. The second one is that they are intrinsically safer. This means that we are not going to need this type of heavy casing, but okay. something that will be smaller and lighter. So my size has the same power as your size? Exactly, that's the point. And this one, is it with the new technology? No, this one is a, let's say, is a previous technology. Is this one yes. the old version? Yeah. So it's an even older version than this one. Oh, wow. This is the EcoPulse battery from the uh, EcoPulse demonstrator we have seen. So you've seen this plane downstairs already and how long can you fly with electricity right now? Okay, so in this particular demonstrator we were doing several minutes and uh, let's say quite, I would say quite longer, but it was not the, uh, the objective to go into long ranges or uh, long flights. It was more about exploring the battery technology, what is 800 volt battery, what is distributed propulsion, what's going on, how to use the flight controls in that cases. So this is why for us the range or let's say all other aspects have been more instrumental because they were not the main objective. So this is why we have not pushed to go beyond the sort of minutes and several let's say hours in overall flight test campaign. Is this battery already included into one of your test planes? Not yet. We are working on them uh, still at the prototype phase, but uh, we know that automotive industry wants to put this technology into their production facilities in the next two to five years. So we expect that we will be access, we'll have access to those technology, let's say in that uh, in that uh, time range, so that we will be able to fly our next prototypes and products with this technology. So maybe we have to come back to this one in two to five years. Exactly, and you will see the real yeah. one with this technology. Nice. So I have a guest of honor today. Maybe you can introduce yourself better than I can. I'm Bertrand Picard. I'm Swiss. I'm an explorer. I'm a medical doctor. And I love to use technological innovation in aviation to give a message of how the world can be cleaner, more efficient and work better. Especially for us as glider pilots, your project is really interesting because it looks similar to a plane, but it has a significant difference. What's the difference to a glider? For my first project, it yes. was solar impulse. Yes. It was a huge airplane with a wingspan of a jumbo jet, but the weight of a family car and purely solar. No fuel, just solar panels on the, on the wings. And I flew around the world with it. How many people fit inside? One at a time. One. We had to be extremely light, mm -hmm. otherwise we would not have enough batteries to go through the night. So basically we're flying during daylight to charge the batteries and then in the night we're using the battery. The next morning the sun came back so we could charge again. And like this we could fly day and night. I trained on gliders to be able to get familiar with the adversarial 
you know, because on this plane it was crazy. It was so big and so slow that when you put the stick on the right, you have the bank on the right, but it turns on the left. Which license do you need to fly your big first project? The civil aviation asked me to, have, to be IFR pilot, twin engine, glider and motor glider. So everything, basically. <laughs> Almost everything. That was a very successful project, not to demonstrate clean aviation, because I don't think there will be ever solar airplanes transporting passengers. But it was a project showing the promotion of renewable energies, how solar energy can do something that seems impossible, like flying around the world with no fuel. And that worked well. And what is your current project? And the current project now is to fly non-stop, zero emissions, all around the world on a hydrogen airplane. That will be more industrial project. Mm -hmm. Solar impulse was very symbolic. Yes. Climate impulse is an industrial project where we show how we can decarbonize, how it can be used for aviation. And uh, so just imagine you take solar power to electrolyze water and produce hydrogen. Then you liquefy this hydrogen and put it in hydrogen tanks at minus 253 degrees, so really cold. And uh, you use the boil off of this hydrogen, little evaporation to go through the fuel cell and run electric motors. And like this, we hope that we can fly for nine days. Space and observation, and we're gonna head straight in. I'm really excited for what's to come. The satellites have quite a good resolution, so you could even see the airplanes taking off and landing at those strips. So um, here, all this footage was taken with the Airbus satellites. So how does Airbus use the data of satellites? First of all, if there is a hurricane, you can track the damage in the villages. Second, the water pollution can be seen from space. We also saw the example of the gold digging and the deforestation is a big one. So I'm really happy to see what's next and I'll see you later. Let's go and see the Airbus 350. Welcome to the A350 fab. Let's see what the Airbus 350 can do. I just heard that it has the perfect size for all type E airports, which means that the wingspan is perfectly fit to the terminal sizes. And so that's quite efficient. And we're going to hear more in shortly. Hi, I'm uh, Abraham, uh, White Body Product Marketing Manager, uh, and I am an A350 Product Marketing Manager for my bus. I have a question for you. Yes. How long does it take for the first part to arrive until the final assembly and then the first flight? Yes, in theory, uh, the, when the sections arrive, it's 59 days mm -hmm. before the first the time the aircraft goes out when it's finished from the assembly line and goes to the flight line. Mm -hmm. So this is in theory about six, uh, 50, 60 days. 60 days, that's 60 days. quite fast. Yeah. Um, for reference, I'm a glider pilot and yeah. I have been to a glider manufacturing yeah. factory mm -hmm. and they take nine months for a whole sailplane to yeah. manufacture and the sailplane is much smaller. smaller. Yes. <laughs> it's true and, and, and this is where we take pride in the way we uh, uh, assemble our planes, the logistics involved, involved behind, the supply chain involved behind. And that's why, in fact, if you look at each station, when we say uh, section 59, then that means uh, T minus 59 days before the flight line. Mm -hmm. So this is our target. And then we are at now standing at uh, station 40. This means, so this airplane in the next 40 days needs to go in the flight line. Where we are right now is the final assembly line. Mm -hmm. We have different sites uh, in uh, throughout uh, Europe and different parts of the world where uh, different parts of the plane are being manufactured and are being brought here mm -hmm. and the assembly takes place here. Cool, thank yeah. you so much. It's, well, it's a pleasure. Yeah. So I spotted someone in the crowd with an orange suit and I wanted to ask you what's your job here? So my job is uh, to be a flight test engineer. So I'm a flight crew flying on board uh, the prototype aircraft at Airbus Commercial. 
uh, doing the flight test together with the rest of the crew, uh, which is usually constituted from two pilots, a test flight engineer. As the test engineer, do you have a license yourself? I've got a, a private pilot license. Ah, so you're uh, a fellow pilot. <laughs> yes, uh, which, is, uh, which is useful for talking about the radio and uh, also understanding the situation the pilots may be in uh, during the, uh, the flight in general. another expert on sustainable aviation fuel actually. Can you briefly introduce yourself? What do you do at Airbus? My name is uh, Julien Manès. I'm uh, working at Airbus and I'm responsible for SAF and CDR development for Airbus. SAF standing for sustainable aviation fuels and CDR standing for uh, carbon dioxide removal. My first question is what exactly is sustainable aviation fuel? What's the difference between like regular fuel and this fuel? So we should uh, always uh, remember that uh, SAF is a blend. It's using a sustainable feedstock uh, to produce that fuel. And when I say sustainable feedstock, it can be biomass, uh, biomass that absorbs CO2 right from the beginning. And this biomass, then we turn into fuel, we mix it with a kerosene, and when we burn, then we still produce CO2, but we release CO2 that was originally in the atmosphere. Ah, oh, right, it was already existing. And that's the main difference with a conventional fuel, because conventional fuel is coming from crude oil, mm -hmm. and crude oil you, found, you find in the soil. Yeah. So essentially with crude oil, you're extracting carbon from the soil, and you're releasing it in the atmosphere, where unfortunately it stays for centuries. So if this fuel already exists, why do we not fly with this fuel right now? Well, uh, it exists and uh, it's been existing for uh, nearly a decade. And uh, we started our journey together with uh, the producers of fuel and uh, a lot of technical experts in making sure that uh, we could do that mix uh, and in the end make a fuel, SAF, that is fully compatible with our aircraft. Mm -hmm. And in fact, to keep it very simple, SAF is Jet A1. Mm -hmm. So from a, an aircraft perspective, from a, and a helicopter perspective, we cannot make a difference. Yeah. So that was our very first challenge to make sure that uh, SAF would be just a, a conventional fuel from a technical standpoint. If I have a glider with a turbine, I actually flew it last year. I had to fuel it with Jet A1. Could I fuel it with sustainable aviation fuel? Absolutely, because SAF is Jet A1. It is the exact same yeah, thing? Yeah, this blend of mm -hmm. uh, the synthetic fuel and the kerosene mm -hmm. uh, that is delivered by the fuel producer is coming, fulfilling the Jet A1 specification. The, the chemical composition is uh, slightly different. The fuel properties are exactly the same and fulfilling the Jet A1 specification. And that's what matters. And that's super important for us. It's uh, the safety aspect of SAF. So flying on SAF is purely transparent from a, an aircraft perspective, be it on uh, safety, uh, be it on performance. What is now stopping me from actually getting the sustainable aviation fuel? Why is it not everywhere? Uh, because the problem with SAF, or the challenge I'd rather say, uh, is that this synthetic part that uh, we blend with uh, the uh, conventional fuel is two to three times more expensive than conventional fuel. It's always the costly factor. So that, that makes for a big difference. Uh, thankfully, uh, when uh, you're flying a glider, uh, the fuel bill is not that big. Yes, true. Uh, but uh, when you're flying uh, an A350 or an A320, uh, the fuel bill can be as big as 30 to 50% of uh, the total operating cost. So uh, essentially, the question we're left with is uh, who's going to pay for the green premium? And to reduce the green premium, uh, we will have to work on scaling because economies of or mass production will bring economies of scale that will reduce uh, slightly the uh, cost of production. In a nutshell, the more demand, the cheaper you can produce the fuel for and then prices will eventually get lower and then there's like a tipping point again. And this is where we, we have and uh, things I know that your community knows about flying. It's all about the efficiency. Yeah. So uh, what is super important first is to avoid burning unnecessary fuel. And in fact, avoid means in our case, replace the, the old aircraft, uh, the 747, uh, the old A340s, with brand new generation aircraft. Mm -hmm. Because the aircraft that are delivered today, they deliver 20 to 30% fuel reduction. And that's avoided fuel, fly smartly, I would say. So uh, for a commercial jetliner, it means fly straight. Uh, do continuous descent approach. All those measures, those procedures that allow saving fuel when you can. The more fuel you've avoided burning, the cheaper the self-bill will be. 
cost per kilometer. Basically. Absolutely. The next thing uh, coming is to use a, a fuel that is less carbon intensive, and that's where SAP fits in. I'm here with Greg. What's your job at Airbus? I have the privilege to working at Airbus and being responsible for disruptive research and technology and innovation. Therefore, everything what we are going to be seeing in the next next generation of the aircrafts, this is my job. Therefore, it's really the best job I can have. Maybe you can tell me how is AI impacting Airbus and its efficiency or maybe even sustainability? Oh, of course, AI is everywhere. And honestly speaking, for, for us, AI is not just starting today. We are already using AI for years. <laughs> Uh, and if we talk about the sustainability, we can think about the AI already in the development where, for example, we can accelerate our simulations and then we are getting much more faster to the end results. But also the AI is going to improve safety and also efficiency of our aircrafts. If we think about the next, next generation of the aircrafts where AI and could be also generative AI together with computer vision is going to improve the safety and help our aircrafts to be more smarter in the uh, in the operations. So you mean in navigating or in like for me as a pilot is there an impact or is it for the production or the aerodynamics? This is both. It could be also for aerodynamics. For example, if you looked the one of our demonstrators, extra performance wings, then you need also the sensors which are controlling this extra performance wing. And then with the AI models, you can optimize the performance of this. Uh, so the flaps are automatically adjusted in flight? The flaps are going to be automatically adjusted in the flight based on the conditions. And the conditions are measured through the sensors. And because we are using many sensors, you you have to have very performance models. Therefore, AI can be the one of the solutions which is going to be optimizing the use of energy on the compute power in order to calculate this. And then if you use AI, you are reducing this energy of the compute and then therefore you can control it better with the less energy consumption. Sounds really futuristic. Maybe one silly question. Do you think pilots will ever be replaced by like you say autonomous driving, autonomous flying, is this a thing? You know, I'm disruptive <laughs> uh, research and technology, therefore I, I think we need the pilots for time being and we are going to be needing them for, for the, in the future as well. The question is how much work which the pilots are doing today can be done by machine in order to improve the safety. Therefore, I think the combination of the human machine is going to be with us for years to come because it will be, in my opinion, the best combination to guarantee safety. And uh, this is the most important for our industry. I'm really excited to see whether we're gonna fly to holidays with a robot or with humans. Thank you so much for your input. Thank you very much for having me. I hope you enjoyed the Airbus Summit video. I really love the different technologies and I'm excited to see what the future holds. Let me know in the comments which technology you prefer and what do you think which one is gonna last. So I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye!